The Tilton Evo is easily one of the most popular cars competing at World Time Attack Challenge with the original Tilton, let's call it version 1.0, winning the Pro Class a few years back. Unfortunately last year Costa, the owner of the car, ended up crashing the car in pretty spectacular fashion. It was deemed that the car wasn't repairable and we're here with version 2.0 that's made its track debut this weekend. We're here with Trent from TM Automotive, builder of the car, to find out a little bit about what makes it so fast. Now Trent, let's just go back to the original Vision 1.0, already an incredibly fast car, already really well proven. Uh, unfortunately after that crash, was it just not recoverable? It had too much damage that we saw that it wasn't feasible to reuse it. Um, we didn't need to use much of it in the new chassis but it was deemed we're probably better off starting with a new one. Ultimately, Evo chassis aren't hugely expensive either, and I'm guessing that there were some changes that you learned from the first car that you wanted to apply. So starting with a clean sheet of paper, does that give you some uh, competitive advantage as well? Oh, most certainly, yeah. We can do what we wanted to do, cut out things that we needed to, and change things and start with a clean slate. certainly the way to go. Alright, so first of all it's important to say that while the car is competing here this weekend at World Time Attack Challenge, this was actually a last minute decision and the car really is actually built to go to Japan and compete at Tsukuba, so what was the impetus behind rushing and getting it out here? Costa was just mad about Time Attack, loves it 10 years, so he was just 100% committed and just said mate let's just get into it and have a good go at trying to get it ready and we got it here but it was certainly long nights and massive effort from the crew so it's very very good. I believe the car was essentially built from a, a bare chassis in a little over three months is that about right? Yeah I got the chassis back on the 24th of June just the bare chassis and then we got things made and made it happen pretty much. Alright so going down that path of what you learned from version 1 what have you changed with the chassis with this whole new car? The main thing was to make it light try and get the weight better and down um, trying to get better uh, turbo arrangements and all those sorts of things, improve the car so it actually then becomes a fast car. How much of a challenge is it lightening the car, removing material from the chassis but also remaining within what is still reasonably stringent rules for time attack? Yeah certainly we had to get the chassis analysed so we cut the rear off it but you've got to have a whole lot of bars to keep it strong and so much downforce, they have so much um, strength they need but um, certainly we needed to do a lot of work to the chassis to make it strong and stiff and, and compete and do actually a fast time. Now cosmetically on the exterior, looks really similar to the original Tilton Evo, got a very similar looking aero package and yeah. obviously with Time Attack the aero has become so important to these cars, it's not just about making power, you've really got to have that aero, so is there any major differences with this new car? Not really, the aero is very similar to what we used to run, just a few little minor changes and just refine the aero and where it needs to sit and our main thing is packers and bump rubbers and getting the car to run smooth yep. and that also comes with speed. Uh, now the packers and bump rubbers, again just to dive into that a little bit because this is starting to get a little bit more technical, this is a problem with uh, a car that's essentially a, a road car that's yeah. now got massive amounts of aero yeah. downforce, you're talking really there about balancing the spring rates that yeah. you're using so that the car's still drivable and works well in low speed corners but of course at the end of the front straight 270 to 280 k yeah. the amount of downforce will drive that car down into the ground so that's where you're using the packers and bump yeah, rubbers. So we've got a bump rubber arrangement that we use that it virtually runs on the bump rubber the whole time and it just assists in trying to keep the car off the ground or actually keep the aero going underneath and as soon as it gets and touches the ground you lose it and then it starts pul pulsating and, and it's just no good and so this year we got the rubbers and everything right and the car was really really good and we've learnt a lot over the past years so certainly that bump rubber and packer arrangement is very very critical on, on these cars. Now, I'm right in saying that this car, the Aero package, is developed in conjunction with Voltex in Japan? Yeah, we, um, uh, with Voltex in Japan, he makes all the Aero, sends it out, comes out, fits it all up. Um, he's very, very good at what he does. And uh, yeah, he did a lot of wind tunnel testing with the car. So it, it is a fancy looking, fantastic car. Does a great, great job. Have you got any data that you can share with us or any numbers on terms of how much downforce that, that Aero is producing into turn one? So it's about three tonne of downforce, um, which is a lot. The tyres 
you know, a, a lot of uh, hard job at trying to keep them you know, up and all that sort of stuff. So it's about three tonne. Yeah, it's important to understand with the aero, it's not just about getting that downforce, it's also balancing the amount of drag that it produces as well, which is where also making a huge amount of power comes in. But talking to Garth prior to this interview, he was saying that essentially 275k into turn one and flat through turn one. Yeah, yeah you know, um, you need lots of horsepower. Our aero is quite uh, sleek and doesn't have much drag, so it's very, very good. So we make about 1200 horsepower there and it's uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of grunt. Let's get into that engine and that 1200 horsepower. So obviously the heart there, 4G63, no surprises there. Uh, can you give us a rundown on the mechanical specification of the engine? How are you making that power, and yeah. basically how you're holding it together, just as importantly? So we haven't gone down the billet line like a whole lot of other people. You know, cast is fast. You know, so um, we got the new Borg Warner turbo. There's a few little changes in the engine that we do to keep it together, but it's pretty much just a stock block. and Let, Let's get into that cast versus billet there because there is arguments for both camps. Obviously when you're starting to talk about 2000 plus for a drag car, uh, cast may no longer be an option but certainly at 1200 horsepower uh, we see the 4G63 can hold together pretty reliably at that point. So in your mind where are the, the advantages of staying with the cast block over going billet? So we stay with the cast block because we know what we have and we, it's reliable, we have that. We don't want to take the risk of going to an uh, aluminium block and then having a problem. We know that that block is reliable and we can have that engine package. And it, last year we did a whole lot of testing. We did about 1,100 kilometres on that engine at about 1,000 to 1,200 horsepower. So it's very good. Um, pretty well proven. Yeah, pretty well proven. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. So in terms of these engine packages, we see people using the 63 block, 2 litre, 2.2, 64 block, 2 yeah. litre, 2.4, 2.1, anything in between. Can you tell us sort of what your mentality is on this, the selection and where you've gone to? Yes, so it's just an Evo 9 engine block. We still run Myvec. Um, but yeah, like it's nothing fancy. It's just everything. So else. Still 2 litre? Still uh, 2.2, sorry, yeah. So stroke a crankshaft in the 63 block? Yep, yep. Now you mentioned the Myvec there, so for those who aren't familiar, Myvec basically a continuously variable cam timing on the intake cam. Now we see a lot of people in a race application where you're obviously moving to larger camshafts, uh, sometimes deleting that Myvec and going with fixed cam control. You still obviously see that as an advantage? It's def definitely an advantage for us. Uh, we certainly see that it uh, improves the power mid-range and all that sort of stuff, so we're not going to go away from that. It's definitely better for us. You also mentioned you've moved to the, the a new turbocharger and you're on the Borg Warner platform. Can you tell yep. us what you're running? So it's a new 9280, which is their new turbo, which is great. And it's, mate, we've been with them for years and years now and never ever had a problem with the turbo. So yeah, they're great. So how does that compare to what you're running on the version one of the car? And can you give us some feedback on how the 9280 performs in turbo, terms of uh, power for a sort of certain boost level and boost response? Certainly uh, it is better for a um, little bit of gr grunt mid-range and all that sort of stuff and certainly up the top it makes more grunt. Um, on the same boost setting we make about 535 at about 30 pound of boost on the dyno. We don't dyno it any more than that, uh, there's no point we just tune it on the track and, and go from there. And in terms of running on the track, what sort of boost level are you running up to? And can you, you obviously said, said you're, you're sort of expecting around 1,200 horsepower. Yeah, so we run about 40 pounds. So we run the turbo to the maximum speed, which is 116,000 or something. So we run up there and it's usually about 40 pounds, 42 pounds. And maintaining that, or well, staying underneath that maximum turbo speed is really important if you want to get the reliability out of the Borg Warners. Uh, and in terms of the power delivery, obviously 1200 horsepower is a huge amount to be putting down in the lower gears. Are you using any gear dependent or speed dependent boost control there to make the car manageable? So we run nitrous to get the car onto the boost and has a very good mid-range. We haven't, we actually didn't use it this year yet. Uh, new, new chassis, trying to get some testing and trying to make the car reliable and all that sort of stuff. So we found that running the nitrous helps mid-range a lot and definitely speed. So. So moving on to the electronics package of the car, what have you got running the, the car there in terms of the ECU etc? So it runs Mtron ECU and then runs Motec Dash and V-SIMs and all that sort of stuff. So it's uh, certainly a lot of sensors, a lot of electronics, it's, it's, it is quite, quite technical. 
Could you, maybe without going too deep, could you give us a, a bit of a, an insight into some of those sensors you're using and maybe even just a quick glimpse into how you are using those when the car comes back, when Garth comes back in from, from a session to analyse the car's performance and decide on, on improvements for the next session? Yeah, so it runs EGTs and pressure sensors before and after the turbo to make sure there's no boost leaks and back pressure on the manifold so we don't over um, hurt the manifold and all that sort of stuff. So certainly there's a lot of sensors. There's going to be TPMS, which is tyre pressure monitoring services and all that sort of stuff. We didn't run them this year, but we're going to get them yeah. ride height sensors and all that sort of stuff, which tells you how low the car gets down and helps us tune the car. Um, and then you've got shock graphs and all that sort of stuff. So, um, it is quite technical, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're talking about a incredibly technical car though, so if you want to get the most out of any car at this level, having that data is essential. Uh, let's move on to the drivetrain there. Can you tell us what the, the transmission and centre differential arrangement is? Yeah, so we run a Hollinger gearbox. It's been ultra-reliable, uh, very, very good. Then we run the standard type, Center diff, so Mitsubishi. We do a lot of work in there, but it's but it's still the standard case and standard parts inside. Let's just go back there. So that that uh, Hollinger, there's a six-speed sequential, but you've paddle shifted as well. Paddle shifted six-speed sequential. Um, they've done a whole lot of work in that, and it's it is really really reliable there. So we're not going to go away from that. That's no way. The advantage there as well is the driver can keep his hands on the wheel. Yeah. Uh, I'm assuming you're running a auto blip to, to rev match on the downshift as well, so again the driver can concentrate solely on optimising the braking performance. Yeah, certainly we have all that sort of stuff, so he uh, just has to drive it. And a car that this fast, you really have to be committed and you don't, you don't have much time to do much anything else. So. In terms of that centre differential, you've got the ability there, or at least with, through the Mitsubishi yeah. centre diff controller, you've got the ability to vary the torque split slightly. Uh, how important is that? Are you you're utilising that functionality as well to optimise the car's handling? Yeah, the guys have their own programs that we use and certainly helps with um, turn, turn in and, and getting power down, so that's certainly a very good advantage to have that. Look, it's great to get some insight into the car there, Trent, and uh, certainly, obviously, the car's been built for Sakuba, as we mentioned. Looking forward to seeing how it goes once you've got some more testing yeah. under your belt. Uh, this weekend probably been a bit of a weekend of what could have been with uh, some really high potential on the table, but unfortunately it just wasn't quite uh, to happen this weekend, but all the best for the future. Yeah, no worries, thank you, and yeah, it was credit to the team. We got out there and had a good go, but couldn't show the full potential but we'll be out there again and we'll go to the Subaru and see how we go. Oh, good luck. Thanks mate. If you liked that video make sure you give it a thumbs up and if you're not already a subscriber make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week and if you like free stuff we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson.